So good morning once again to everyone who has just joined us. We are now being broadcasted live at our Facebook page. So if uh, somebody is interested in reposting uh, or the broadcasting, please go to the Facebook page of the Friedrich Hebert Foundation Ukraine. Our page is named like FES Ukraine. There you can find the broadcasting and this is reposted if you wish to do so. I'm seeing uh, new members joining uh, joining our our seminar. So just a couple of minutes, we would uh, wait for those who are one minute late. Hello. And uh, hello, Wilfred. Glad to see you. Hi. And we will start just in a minute or two. The discussion. I think all the speakers are here. I see Nicola Tarova, I see Wilfred, I see Konstantin Bilyanenko, our moderator Alvidas is also here, David here, so perfect. I mean, at least the speakers are here, that's already important. So. So I'm adding another person to our group. So I think yeah, yet another person. Very good. Okay, I will proceed further with this action after a small introduction. So uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, good morning. A very well welcome to all of you. On behalf of the Friedrich Hebert Foundation representative office in Ukraine and the NGO Donbas Beach, let us cordially welcome you at our web seminar dedicated to the topic of Ukraine and the Sierra Vador, economic bottleneck, security hotspot, ecological problem area, and the object of dispute under the international law. Uh, let me please apologize for the absence of our director Marcel Rossi today with us. And uh, my name is Maria Kovalevanchar. I'm a project coordinator of the Friedrich Hebert Foundation of Ukraine. And me, together with my colleague Alvidas Medalinskas, who is the deputy head of the NGO Don Bastis, who will be moderating today our online discussion. Um, I think uh, I would say a few words about the Friedrich Hebert Foundation. We are a German political foundation which is politically affiliated with the Social Democratic Party of Germany. And the NGO Donbass Gates uh, started its activity in 2017 and is primarily dealing with the political, economic, and social development in Donbass and the issues related to the rule of law in Donbass. Uh, this NGO consists of a group of experts on law issues, professionals from Donbass and outside of the regions who have professional interests uh, to Donbass. And our co-moderator today, with whom I would be delighted to, to share this job today, Alvidas Medalinskas, is an international expert on Donbass, a former MP, and the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Parliament of Lithuania, who is a, as a political analyst for more than 20 years, is involved professionally to the issue of Ukraine, and his main specialization since 2014 is political, economical, and social development of Donbass region. So we will help professional moderator, my colleague today, who will be helping us to have our discussion as smooth as possible. Uh, the aim of our event today is to provide an interdisciplinary view of the region. We will be looking at legal, political, economic, environmental aspects, and to this end, we have invited recognized Ukrainian and international experts from various institutions, as well as representatives of the Ukrainian state bodies, in order to present different aspects of the situation in the adult scene. 
And we will be analyzing today a complex of issues pertaining to the Sea of Azov and the Kerch Strait waters, which from the international law point of view belong to those which are jointly used by Ukraine and Russian Federation and according to the of 2003, these waters have the status of the historically internal waters of the two states. Uh, furthermore, the illegal actions by the occupation authorities in Crimea since 2013 have been a major factor of security situation come down in both Azov and Black Sea region, and now it is characterized by growing instability and deterioration. The economic direction is also characterized by artificial barriers to free commercial shipping and the threat of maritime transport in the Kerch Strait and Sea of Azov due to the illegal construction of the so-called uh, Crimean Bridge. So this is the situation we're in. Without any further delay, I think it's high time that we give the floor to our distinguished speakers to whom we are very grateful for their time and effort taken in order to get prepared to, to, to this event and in order to present to our international audience the best of their knowledge with regard to their above mentioned topic. At this point, I would please uh, welcome my colleague, Albert Medalinska, to take the moderation and introduce our first speaker. Uh, so, Albert, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Maria. Uh, good morning uh, to everybody. I'm very glad to see in our uh, the second webinar uh, on Donbass together with uh, Albert uh, Stiftung. Uh, so many uh, prominent speakers uh, from Ukraine and Germany, and also the participants of the discussion, they see from the Kligenthal Institute, from other institutions in Germany also. So it's really a very pleased to see all of you. We have uh, five speakers uh, today, so therefore we will not have any introduction and just probably will go directly to the uh, questions uh, to the speakers and would ask you to talk about uh, three, five minutes to answer the questions, nor that we would have uh, afterwards question and answering uh, time. So first of all, I would like to introduce uh, Oksana Zolterova, who is a Deputy General, uh, a Deputy Director General for the International Law on the Ministry of the Foreign Affairs of Ukraine. And the question would be such, I mean, we all know about these problems, which, uh, and, uh, which Ukrainian ships and also ships were uh, going to the Ukrainian seaports, Mariupol, Berdansk, experienced in the last uh, several years. So what really uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs is doing, uh, maybe together with the Western partners, in order to ensure this free passage of ships uh, by the Kerch uh, Straits? And also, uh, what is doing in the practical matters, then by solving various issues which are related to Azov Sea, would not endanger the situation with uh, the policy of non-recognition of annexation of uh, Crimea by Russia. Uh, thank you so much. Good morning, uh, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to speak, uh, to have to be part of, part of this discussion. Uh, so from the MFA perspective, um, we are the foreign ministry and we usually um, uh, plan our work in different directions. First is the political dimension and working through international forums and through international organizations. Uh, since the unlawful annexation of the Crimea, uh, we launched uh, a couple of uh, UNGR resolutions that, that also cover the issue of the Sea of Azov. Uh, these are the of the human rights in Crimea and the resolution on militarization. Uh, we put up these uh, uh, questions in different other fora. We uh, after 2018, when Russia engaged in the campaign uh, of uh, the unlawful stoppages of the ships, so we uh, managed to get a number of the resolutions from European Parliament. Also, the work is done on the bilateral level, and we raise uh, this question uh, on the issue of the Sea of Azov and the Kerch Strait. Uh, during our bilateral talks with our partners, and uh, you may uh, find uh, a lot of statements by different governments condemning uh, Russian's actions in the Sea of Azov and in the Kerch Strait. Uh, but we are not only po uh, politicians, uh, we also uh, do uh, a big legal job in this case. 
uh, we launched, uh, uh, MFA launched a big case against the Russian Federation uh, under the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, because we uh, think that what Russia is doing and now in the Sea of Azov, in the Kerch Strait, and in the Black Sea is of the violation of the uh, core principles of uh, the UNCLOS Convention. And of course, also it violates the sovereign rights of Ukraine. So we launched our case uh, under, under this convention back in 2016. Unfortunately, the international law is not a very uh, fast uh, mechanism. And we understand it and we understood it from the very beginning. And uh, only uh, four years after we launched uh, this case, uh, we managed to go through the preliminary objection phase and go through the jurisdictional phase in this uh, case against the Russian Federation. We got the decision on jurisdiction uh, only a couple of months ago on February. Um, and the arbitral tribunal found itself that it has jurisdiction to uh, command on Ukraine's uh, position in the Sea of Azov and in the Kerch Strait uh, uh, in full. And now uh, some of the jurisdictional objections were uh, dismissed uh, by the, uh, uh, were not dismissed, uh, vice versa. They were supported by the arbitral tribunal. And that's why we are also launch where we are preparing a new memorial where we will focus on Russia's violations in the Sea of Azov and in the Kerch Strait in a wide scope of dimensions. Uh, that we will present to the arbitral tribunal by November, and then maybe the case will go to the merits phase. I think that um, now it's a good time for you to ask me questions, not to. to to talk to you what you are really interested in. Yes, uh, well, thank, thank you very much. I also uh, raised the question about uh, uh, what uh, you're doing you know, the, uh, by solving various practical questions uh, in the Azov Sea but not in danger the policy of uh, non-recognition of annexation, which is also very much important one when you're solving various practical issues in Azov Sea. Um, so uh, it is very difficult to solve uh, practical issues uh, with uh, the Russian Federation, and it's very difficult to talk to them. Uh, we, what we are practically doing is uh, we are uh, bringing up the solidarity with Ukraine and our partners also call on the Russian Federation and we see that it, it is working because we had uh, a big wave of stoppages of vessels uh, in 2018 but after the pressure of the international community, uh, thanks God, now it is, uh, the situation is uh, better. Okay, Maria, so the floor is yours. Okay, then we will have this. Uh, thank you very much, Juan, uh, first of all, uh, Ms. Oltenberg, for your introduction with regard to what Ukraine is doing uh, in a legal sphere in order to defend its national interest. And I think in order to go further, and first we have the presentation of all of our speakers, I would uh, invite Hanna Shellas, the editor-in-chief of the Ukraine Analytica and also a director of the Security Studies Program of the Foreign Policy Council of Ukrainian Prisons, uh, to also step in and uh, as a well-known security expert, as an editor and a co-author of the strategic appraisal of the Naval Forces of Ukraine, we would ask her to uh, also reflect upon the advisor issue, as the Azov Sea remains a security hotspot for Ukraine. Hanna, do you see the threat of the so-called slow annexation of the Sea of Azov by Russia? And uh, can Ukraine, what can Ukraine do to defend its strategic interests? And what role does the military capacity of Ukraine in the Sea of Azov with all its geographical particular, uh, particularities play and could play in this process? Hanna, Thank you, Maria, your... for your question. And uh, uh, thanks to both organizations uh, for organizing this interesting event. And if to go directly to the uh, um, business, to the core of your question, um, probably the situation with Azo is complicated because from the tactical point of view, it's quite unique. And definitely we can talk about the certain particularities about the Ukrainian strategy, both military and political, 
that should be aimed uh, just for Azov, and I will explain uh, why it is. But at the same time, we need to understand that from the strategic point of view, Azov Sea is not uh, um, separated. It is a part of the maritime domain of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine and of the Russian aggression. So if we follow the Russian Federation activities on the sea, we definitely can see the whole pattern of the same activities both in Azov and the Black Sea and uh, a little bit of the crapping activities. Uh, if for probably before 2018, we've been predominantly speaking about the uh, uh, land operations, land threats, so for the last two years, we started to see more and more of the direct evidences that uh, the Azov Black Sea Basin, as we name it, so as a whole complex, uh, became the uh, third dimension or the third domain of the Russian activities besides the uh, Donbass and uh, Crimea. So uh, if we speak from the strategic point of view, that, that is definitely, first of all, the attempts to limit Ukrainian access to the sea. The second, it is the support of the constant threat from the sea that the possible attack can happen at any time. The third is the limitation of safety uh, and uh, breaking of the safety of navigation uh, in the Ukrainian territorial waters or on the maritime route uh, trade um, uh, uh, trade routes that is going to the Ukrainian ports. And as we know, approximately 70% of Ukrainian export is going uh, by uh, sea. So that's uh, not just the security threat, but it has the serious, it can have a serious implications for the economic situation uh, as well. And that is also the uh, provocation of the incidents, and we saw many of them uh, that we perfectly understand that you don't need the open big attack, but any uh, type of the incident on sea uh, can have quite a, um, serious implications afterwards. But if we uh, narrow the picture just for Azov Sea, it is necessary to understand that uh, it is extremely important from the military point of view because of three reasons. Reason number one, it is the extreme closeness to um, so-called uncontrolled territories uh, of, of Donbass. Yeah? Because uh, the distance from Mariupol to the front line is extremely short. The second is that because of the geographic particularities of the Azov of the sea, it is very small of sea, a uh, very small sea, it is much easier to initiate attacks from the sea than previous attacks, first of all. Uh, the um, uh, second issue is uh, definitely the Kerch uh, bridge and uh, uh, all the possibilities for blocking. And I can't say that it is a slow annexation happening. It seems to me that there were attempts to do it. But what we see now that uh, when Ukrainian uh, uh, Navy boats started to escort um, ships coming uh, to and from uh, Berdansk and Mariupol ships, we definitely started to see the decrease in attempts of the illegal stoppings, or at least of the open provocation against the uh, merchant fleet uh, in Azov Sea. It's still not the resolved issue. It is still the issue that can erupt at any moment. But um, at least we see the developments and we see the Navy actions uh, happening there to protect the uh, um, activities uh, of, of, for Ukrainian uh, seaports. And definitely uh, it is the closeness uh, to Crimea itself. And as we understand perfectly that the Russian Federation is interested in connecting uh, their mainland with the as of not only uh, with the Crimea, not only by the bridge, but um, in more general uh, strategic perspective. So all of this made Azov for uh, some kind of concentration of those problems that exist and that um, are either reacted or should be reacted. And uh, uh, here we definitely are now looking for the new commander of Navy, of Ukrainian Navy. Uh, he just presented his opinions and uh, he said that definitely Ukraine will be uh, increasing its presence in Azov Sea. So even psychologically not to allow Russians to think that um, it is their lake. Uh, he understands perfectly that it's not so easy because of plenty of incidents, cases like, I mean, we can imagine the whole picture, but at the same time, for Ukraine, it is very important to demonstrate uh, that uh, it's not only the state who is present, but also the Navy uh, who is present in Azov Sea. 
and uh, the appearance of the uh, Navy bases in Azov that we've never had before, uh, it is very important uh, elements and uh, their development uh, is having positive effects not only to the security situation, but let's be honest also for the moral situation. I remember our trip to Mariupol uh, um, one and a half year ago, when even the city council said that, you know, as soon as the stable uh, permanent bases started to be developed here, uh, the feeling of safety increased. And it's positively influenced the mood in the city, the uh, um, investors uh, uh, approach to the city and uh, for the possible local economic development. Because when you had just temporary basis, it uh, uh, was still the feeling of the war more than of the security. So now with these uh, development of this Navy um, uh, component in Azov Sea, but not only Navy, are the um, type of forces as well that are developing over there, um, can have this very important psychological uh, effect to the security perception in the region. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Hannah, for your for giving us a comprehensive overview of the value situation in the Gulf Sea is interlinked to the whole situation in the Crimea and how, in general, what are the Russia's plans with regard to its region. Hannah, you have slightly started talking about the influence of the Navy on the investor climate, on the situation in general in the Mariupol or uh, in the cities which are at the coast of the Azov Sea. And I think that our next speaker, who will be speaking about the economic implication, economic potential of the Azov Sea, would complement uh, your, your input. So at this point, I will give the floor to, uh, to David Zahad, who is a consultant of the German economic team and who is, since 2013 has been consulted the governments of Ukraine, Uzbekistan and Georgia on various economic issues. And uh, to my knowledge, the German economic team has recently published a study on the economic potential of the Azov Sea and the economic implication of the transport restriction the Sea of Azov for Ukraine. And you, David, you have been there, one of their main authors. And that's why I would like to ask you the following question. Uh, even though there is an ongoing war and the maritime route cannot be considered fully safe and the ecological situation remains very difficult, industry and infrastructure, they all need modernization. What are the economic changes that you see for the region, especially for the harbors and the, the business connected to, you, to it? Can the logistic dimension alternatively also be covered by other Ukrainian ports uh, which are not located at the Sea of Azov? Uh, what would be your piece of advice to the Ukrainian government on how to deal with this difficult economic situation in the Sea of Azov? Uh, Mr. Saha, the floor is yours. We are very much looking forward to your input. Could you please turn on your mic, Pim? Okay. Oh, yeah, it just went on and off. Sorry, I think it's, it's on now. Okay, uh, we're a group of economic advisors to the Ukrainian government, so uh, this is uh, pay, a group paid for by the German government, so our views are really strictly on the economic policy uh, aspect. And in that regard, yes, we did look at the situation of the, in the Sea of Azov, uh, at what's, what's there essentially now, and what would be a potential threat to Ukraine. Um, as I think many uh, of the, uh, the previous speakers already said, at the moment, we are facing a situation where the ship traffic in and out of Berdyansk and Mariupol, the two Ukrainian Azov Sea ports, is subject to delays, sort of waiting for inspections uh, by the Russian authorities, uh, mainly at the Bridge of Kerch. Uh, so it's really a situation that started with bu the building of the Bridge of Kerch, which sort of created a strategic bottleneck there, if you will. And uh, that's basically the present situation, delays. What we also looked at what, uh, was a threat scenario, which is a very, very hypothetical thing. Nothing like that has happened yet, uh, which would be the real closure of the, the entrance to the Sea of Azov. But that, that is really hypothetical. And so far, there's no indication of that happening. It's just something that theoretically could be done. Um, in uh, terms of what, what the delays are, so the situation that we're facing now, I think uh, it's important to take a look uh, at the length of those delays because that's really the scalable variable. And they peaked at, uh, in 2018 before basically, uh, as the, the speakers before me said, uh, 
the, the situation received international attention and they peaked at around five days per ship on either way so really quite substantial and since then they've never reduced to zero they're still there and there's um, the black sea news website which is actually uh, tracking this uh, very closely and they're still at around 10 hours per uh, per route per ship uh, on average right now so in corona times they sort of reduced further but they're still there and it's basically a variable that can be controlled so it's, uh, it could go up if the political situation is such that it should be going up. Uh, what's the effect of that? I mean, delays don't actually do that much damage per se. They, of course, increase uh, the costs of transportation for the ships and for the cargo owners, depending on the contract. But uh, that's really just a relatively modest increase in, in cost. And I think what we're seeing so far is that this did not, that the cost increase itself did not really harm the ports. The questions, of course, what would happen in case really someone decided to actually close that off, but uh, that's uh, something that we also looked at. Just to see uh, how important are those ports. Those ports are mainly of regional economic importance. They are not nationally large ports. Uh, Mariupol is the larger of the ports, uh, but Jansk is really much smaller. They both only accommodate smaller ships because the other sea itself does only accommodate smaller ships because it's very, relatively shallow. Then the Bridge of Kerch also added uh, a restriction on the height of the ships. So now basically most of those Panamax, Panama Canal fitting uh, uh, ships that previously could still enter but never fully loaded because of the draft restriction, uh, cannot enter anymore and now it's basically restricted to smaller handy max type ships which are basically i mean in terms of the actual load they can carry it's probably ha uh, hasn't had very much of an effect um so that's basically the the capacity of those ports mariupol um has uh, an annual cargo volume of around six million tons uh, per year that's four uh, percent of ukrainian total volume but Jansk is uh, 2 million tons uh, these, uh, these days, 1%, 1.3% of uh, the cargo volume of uh, Ukraine's ports in total. So they're really quite small. The large ports have 25, 30 million tons, even 50, I think, in, uh, in Yushni. So that's, uh, they are smaller ports serving a regional economic value chain. And uh, Mariupol used to be larger in the past in terms of capacity, but that basically is capacity that still is there, but wasn't used anymore because uh, those were steel exports essentially from the now occupied uh, parts of the Donbass. And that, that is not related to the Azov Sea, that's related to the occupation of Donbass. And this cargo volume, which used to be about twice of what it is now, uh, has, has gone away in past years. In terms of what, what, how important are those ports for the regional economy, um, they basically serve two value chains. There are two main exports going through. It's steel from Mariupol, from the two Mariupol steel mills, and it's grains that those are being shipped from Mariupol and Berdyansk. Uh, the steel cargo is much more valuable in terms of actual economic value. We, of course, look at the, uh, at the values on the steel value uh, of the exports was around 2.5 million a billion dollars uh, whereas the grains were sort of two, uh, 250 million dollars in 2018 so that's really um the steel is really the, the important value chain to be looking at and uh, i'm sorry someone tried to call me um um the steel value chain is quite important, for, especially for Donetsk Oblast. It now sort of makes up half of the uh, industrial value added of this Oblast, uh, what's left uh, in, uh, under Ukrainian control. And that's, of course, an important uh, value chain. The grain value chain, especially also for Zaporizhia, is, is not so important. Those are not, it's not an, uh, an agricultural Oblast by any means. It's an industrial Oblast. So it's really the steel value chain that is important. Mariupol is quite dependent on those uh, steel exports uh, and the port economy. Uh, behind it are Avdivka, a small town, but very strategic. Uh, the Kokiri, which is completely dependent on this Kriberik, uh, which uh, serves uh, this steel value chain with iron ore, is more diversified and has its own steel works and so on. So that's not quite economically dependent on it. We looked at the question of what would actually happen if, if those uh, if the Azov Sea were to be closed. And uh, to be honest, what we found out, those exports could be rerouted. The steel value chain would not collapse because already now around half of the steel exports did not leave Ukraine uh, by the Azov Sea, but probably by the Black Sea ports. So the, the rail connection exists. We also looked at the capacity, which uh, was said to be uh, a bottleneck, and we found out 
this capacity is still there, even though uh, Mariupol's excess uh, used to go through occupied parts of the Do uh, Donetsk uh, Oblast, but even, uh, even now, uh, the steel could be brought out. And that's essentially to do with the fact that a train that carries an iron ore can actually also carry out steel. So uh, this Mariupol excess, the, the most bottleneck uh, part of the railroad is actually not a uh, constraining bottleneck in case the Azov Sea were to be blocked, which is, as I <laughs> would like to emphasize, not the case and hasn't really been under discussion so, uh, for now. So basically what we see is that the other ports of Ukraine have enough capacity, the railroad has capacity, there is no imminent threat to Ukraine uh, and to the regional value chains in case something were to be happening on the Azov Sea. Of course, the ports would be closing down. It would be very harmful to Ukraine's uh, city economy uh, because the port is relatively large and Berdyansk it actually made, plays a smaller role, uh, but the region behind it would not uh, suffer that much. There would be an increase in costs, of course. It's more expensive to bring a cargo to the Black Sea, although the ships from the Black Sea themselves are, are cheaper. Um, that would be a potential problem for the steel industry because the steel industry in Ukraine is under pressure anyway. Steel prices are down. Uh, Ukrainian steel production prices are quite high. Um, but uh, honestly, uh, the fluctuations of the world market price for steel are much bigger and much more important in the end than uh, the transport costs here. So we think that uh, this would not be sort of a breakneck issue for the, for the steel uh, industry. And in terms of what could be done, um, I think, you know, many things have been done. There are probably contingency plans by now of how to reroute steel exports quite quickly. Grains is not so difficult. Um, private locomotives are being allowed on Ukrainian networks for the first time. And that's basically resolving what previously could have been one of the bottlenecks, which is actual availability of uh, private of, uh, locomotives on the, on the railroads. So I think most of that has been done. And uh, yeah, that's basically where I would like to leave it at. So far, we see uh, Mariupol and Berdyansk uh, ports are actually even, even increasing in traffic, mainly due to more grains exports. Uh, so the, the delays are not an actually constraining factor right now. And uh, the potential threat scenario to the economy from the Azov Sea, we think, does not really exist. Uh, thank you very much, David. So you left us a bit more optimistic than we raised the question because uh, some of the thoughts you presented were, well, positive in a way. Well, uh, I would give the further give the floor to Alvidas, who would introduce our next speaker, who is based in Verdansk and would provide us the insights on the local economy and environment and ecology. Uh, thank you, thank you, Maria. Uh, well, uh, the Institute of the Fisheries and Marine Ecology, uh, where uh, Konstantin Demyanenko was the deputy director is working, of course, responsible for two issues. One of them ecology and another one uh, fisheries. And both issues are very much important also for the uh, Azov Sea. Uh, so Konstantin Demyanenko is very famous in his uh, understanding of the fisheries policy, even not just in Azov Sea, but in the very distant part of the world, even the Antarctic and others. Uh, so, but now we turn really our attention to the Azov Sea. So what's really the ecology of the uh, Azov uh, Sea now? And what is the impact of this ecology to the uh, fisheries and even the resort, uh, the policy of, uh, you know, the leisure and resort policy uh, for the uh, Ukrainians? But regarding the fisheries, I mean, there are a lot of fishery boats uh, which are in the Azov Sea. And here is another question, which is regarding the situation with the international law situation and Russian actions. But really, how is this fisheries activity uh, important uh, for the uh, people in the region, in Berdansk, Mariupol, and uh, in Piazovia? So, uh, Konstantin, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Arvidas, for this introduction. Uh, I uh, would like to know that uh, I represent the Institute of Fisheries and Marine Ecology, uh, which uh, acting under the State Agency of Fisheries of Ukraine. And uh, uh, I work on the Sea of Azov for fishery problems since, since 1992 year. So a uh, little bit uh, less of uh, 30 years. And I'm here uh, to speak not uh, so 
uh, about political issues, but about ecological problem, uh, status of Ukrainian fishery. And of course, a uh, little bit if we have such time to speak about relation uh, with the Russian Federation uh, in aspect of fishery. So uh, in general, uh, Sea of Azov is very small, seems smallest uh, marine water body by the area and by the water amount contained. Uh, little bit more than uh, 250 cubic kilometer. That is Sea of Azov. Sea is very shallow. Uh, with maximum depths up to 12 meters and very large shallow coastal zone. Large sand beaches, high summer temperature, uh, up to 30 degrees and rather well ecology, always were the factors why the Sea of Azov is so popular, in particular uh, for rest with children. Uh, some details about actual ecology. Uh, ecology conditions are very various in different parts of the Sea of Azov. You will meet absolutely clear sea and air in western part of the Sea of Azov because, because here are no big cities, no commercial navigation, no ports. At the same time, ecological conditions in the eastern part of the Sea of Azov are more difficult due to presence, big cities, heavy industry, and active commercial navigation. As you understand, the, all these factors sometimes are sources of significant pollutions of anthropogenic nature. It would be more correct to note that most of ecological risks are located at area of big cities and ports in northeastern part of the Sea of Azov. Uh, Taganrog Bay at neighbor area of the open sea. Also, there are much ecological risks with active commercial navigation by the main way, waterway for, from Kerch Strait to River Don. Uh, in general, observing the status of water biological objects, we can note on absence of clear signs on possible worsening of ecological situation in the Sea of Azov in aspect of pollution. What seems evident, recalling the factors limited growing of industry and navigation in the region of the Sea of Azov last year. Last year's ecological situation in the Sea of Azov is developing under sustainably growing salinity trend. Nowadays, we register really outstanding salinity in the Sea of Azov up to 15 promille. Thus, each next year, the Sea of Azov becomes more typical marine water body, more and more different of British water body with salinity under 10 promille, what was observed in 2006 to 2007 years. A growing salinity does much changes to the habitat situation for many species in the Sea of Azov. Uh, I can explain some more detailed later in our conversation is, if it is, will be interesting for our auditory. What is the reason of such ecological process? Most likely, the key circumstance is an amount of fresh water coming with the biggest rivers of the Azov Sea Basin, Don and Cuba. Both rivers are strongly overregulated, and that is a big question for us to know is the exact amount of annual freshwater runoff because Don and Cuba are flowing by territory of the Russian Federation. Some specialists assume that a modification of Kerch Strait with building of Kerch Bridge could impact to the water balance of the Sea of Azov, but we haven't the data confirming such assumption for this moment. Besides, we have to know that growing salinity process has become up to much earlier of Kerch Bridge building. So uh, if you allow, I uh, will stop on this moment. Uh, maybe we will speak later about fishery and social aspect of fishery and the international relations. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Konstantin. Uh, of course, we both have to mention the fact uh, because I am now in the region of the Azov Sea as well. Uh, so of this salinity uh, problem with the appearance of the huge number on very big jellyfish 
and this uh, message uh, people send to each other. And I think it will be the impact of the falling down of the tourism incomes from the tourism uh, this summer uh, because of uh, this problem. That's my predictions, of course. But yes, so that's also another economical aspect of the uh, Azov Sea, which is important. Well, Maria, the floor is yours for the introduction of the fifth hour speaker. Yeah, I would like also to thank Konstantin Demjanin for, for presenting the ecological issue. And I think as we will have time to discuss also the social significance and social impact of fisheries for the region. I think it's also one of the vital discussed topics in the media and in the expert circles. But we'll do it uh, afterwards. First, I would like to give the floor to our another expert from Germany. I would give the floor to the Yilge, who is a historian of Eastern Europe and associate fellow of the DGA Peace Global Board Center to Central Eastern Europe and Russia and Central Asia. And uh, uh, he's also a well known expert on our region and also a member of the strategic group of the Bertelmann Foundation on the so called key states, where they are working on the politics of Russia as well as other key countries like Turkey, Iran, China, Saudi Arabia, and the Black and Caspian Sea in the Baltic region and the associated challenges with the EU. And uh, the strategy group has, uh, to my knowledge, just finished their third policy paper on antagonism in the neighborhood of the European Union geopolitical ambitions in the Black Sea Caspian region, and which will be published pretty soon. So taking into account all the experience and knowledge that you possess, uh, could you please provide us uh, with your view on the recommendations for the EU stakeholders? Like, do you see any concrete threat in the nearest future for the region? Some experts are talking about the danger of a Russian military operation in the south of Ukraine to ensure the water supply to the Crimea and the, that they want to make the connections of the Russian military the, making the connections with the Russian military exercise that COP was 2020. Well, how would you assess these warnings and what would be your piece of advice with regards to the actions to be further taken by Germany and by the EU to support the stability in the Sea of Azov and in the wider region? Um, Mr. Yilke, the floor is yours. We are very much looking forward to your input and uh, to discussion with you. Yeah, thank you so much, Maria. Thank you, Alvedas, uh, for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, make that discussion with that outstanding experts and colleagues. Uh, I would like uh, to recall some basic approaches of Russia to the south. Uh, if we want to understand the conflict in the Black Sea region, and I include here the conflict in the Azov uh, Sea, we should take into account that it is not only a function of the current Ukrainian-Russian conflict, what is absolutely right, and I very support Hannah, that the Donbas conflict is only a function of the wider conflict which originated in the annexation of Crimea. And it is a big problem of the international community and partners of Ukraine that we a little bit forgot about that thousand aspect. We cannot, in my view, we cannot resolve the Donbas conflict if the partners of Ukraine remain passive in the south. The second point is that you have to uh, understand for Russian, it is even not only about Ukraine. For Russian, it is about to strengthen and the control in the southern seas. That means to strengthen the control over logistic and military logistic routes between the Caspian Sea, the Volga Azov Channel, the Azov Sea, and the Black Sea region, outreaching to the Eastern Mediterranean. Please take into account that Black Sea Fleet has become the logistic lifeline of the Syrian war of Russia uh, in the last time, and is very important for uh, supply troops uh, there. So uh, given that uh, um, bigger background, uh, I also want to uh, say that for me, the case in uh, the, 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 the incident in the Azov Sea in 2018 was not uh, a conjunctural escalation. It was a systematic third step of expansion of the occupation of Crimea after first the occupation uh, the, the annexation of Crimea, secondly, 
the occupation of the gas platforms in the western north Mediterranean uh, uh, Black Sea um, before the shores of Ukraine. Uh, we should take into account that the international community was very silent, and I think that is a big problem, about that occupation and is silent because uh, the outcome of that occupation, de facto occupation of these platforms, is not only that Russia uh, illegally exploits the gas fields of Ukraine, but is that we have here a military occupied zone which uh, enforces ships, commercial ships, to take certain trade routes, not along the Crimea, but along uh, the site of Odessa. So, in fact, we have a wider occupation of sea zones, which are, uh, if, you, if you make a central line in that part of the Black Sea, are nearer to Odessa than Crimea. And uh, on certain corridors, we have uh, a narrowing for ships of 25 kilometers between the Snipe Island, for example, before Romania, and the outermost uh, platforms, uh, which are occupied, by the way, not only by FSB, but by the Black Sea Fleet and the so-called Operation Forces of Russia. So what I want to say is that Azov Sea is um, let me say I, how to say it in, in English. Uh, in Germany, I call it Handlungsmuster. It is um, a behavioral pattern of Russian policy. And it is a role model maybe for the next step. And the next step, and that is, I think, not uh, some, I want not to demonize a Russian policy, but we should really see that uh, the situation uh, in the Black Sea, uh, before the shores of, of southern Ukraine, has become really very precarious. And uh, what uh, um, Hannah said uh, is also absolutely right. When uh, we see that uh, Ukrainian ships now escort commercial ships to the ports, uh, Russian interventions become uh, 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 were, were diminished. But on the other side, when we look at the whole Black Sea, we should be clear that Ukrainian Navy is still being built. It is not finished, that building up. Ukrainian Navy was de facto destroyed in 2014. And Ukraine cannot share the burden alone to secure the situation of navigation in all its economic zones, at least. That is very important to understand. Secondly, we should take into account that the aggression in Black Sea region is not only a Ukrainian problem. We have an armament in Crimea that actually concerns Europe. We have a crow up of cruise missiles, which is really alarming in Crimea and which concerns not Ukraine only, but actually Europe and the NATO. So uh, I would also recall here the responsibility also of European Union for its uh, own sea. It is not a far away region like the Sahel zone or the Syrian conflict. It is European Union, uh, partly at least. Uh, second point. Um, what we also should, uh, and, and to, 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 if, we, if we have that constellation and see now that uh, fierce situation with, with water supply in Crimea, we should, be, uh, um, we should be aware of, at first, the words of Putin in December, that he declared again the whole region of Northern Black Sea as an ancient Russian land. Please uh, take that into account. It is the same argumentation of Novorossiya. Uh, secondly, uh, um, of course, the absolutely asymmetry, military asymmetry, and the creeping annexation and jurisdiction also by using um, Cree zones of international law. For example, see that, see please, that in August, in summer last year, Russia by, um, let me say not illegal, but by not correctly registering military SNAP exercises, in fact, close 25% uh, uh, of the whole surface of, Black sea re of the Black Sea. Uh, and, and all these measures together, they do not present any time a big escalation, but it is a creeping, um, let me say, expansion of control which makes the military operative position for Russia more and more better, actually, when it comes to the mainland of, of Ukraine uh, in the south. And we also have to take into account that 
the ports which are really matter for Ukrainian com economy are the ports of Odessa, uh, uh, Ch uh, Chornomorsk, so ports which are profitable and which have a big importance for the crane export. Uh, to, if, if we take that into account, that situation, I think we very closely have to observe the situation because we cannot exclude that Putin, if he cannot resolve by own means the problem of water supply in Crimea, will also take at least threats of escalation to pressure on Ukraine um, and to um, pressure Ukraine uh, for, um, uh, for maybe open uh, the North Crimean uh, uh, Canal uh, for water supply for Crimea, because Crimea, as you know, and that is a problem, is depending uh, normally be, until 2014 or, or on the water uh, uh, of northern Crimean Canal in the Kherson Oblast. The problem is that we see at the moment also a growing Russian propaganda in the media. For example, they are speaking about a human catastrophe, which is originated by uh, Ukrainians who don't want to supply water to Crimea. Um, it fits very nice in the narrative of uh, so-called threats of terrorist nationalist attacks in the Azov Sea, so that these nationalists of Ukraine again will destabilize our Crimea. And we see a field of words like international law, human catastrophe, uh, uh, Russian military doctrine, uh, in order to put these words in a context which give a legal right for Russian uh, to also maybe use a uh, military force. And that is, I think, a problematic situation. What can be done? That is, of course, difficult <laughs> because um, uh, at first, European Union uh, should do these things under the level of mili military means uh, which which could be done. For example, Heiko Maas already in 2018, and that proposal is in the room, wanted to have a permanent monitoring in the Azov Sea. And I think that is possible uh, on the base of a distant monitoring. It is a possible on the base of rotation monitoring group of European Union in Mariupol, in Odessa, which also make use of these institutions in Ukraine, which are permanently monitoring all the situation. Secondly, uh, European Union, uh, all in all, needs an own empirical basis of monitoring what is going on in Crimea and in the whole Black Sea. And for example, could launch a project of institutions including the Black Sea uh, Institute uh, in Ukraine uh, to uh, in develop uh, a broad basis of information to, uh, in order to make European Union capable to react on cases like what happened in 2018. Thirdly, European Union also, I think, has a big own interest uh, to protect their own ships, because many ships which were blocked in Azov Sea were ships under European flag. And uh, we also have a big interest in protecting the navigation to the grain ports of Ukraine. I mean, that is international law. If European Union further will ignore the permanent creeping or covered or hybrid violations and attacks, uh, international law will be undermined, and that is absolutely not in the interest. So we should think about maybe also not to uh, let the burden of patrolling, for example, of ships, which is already uh, done now. So NATO is much more present now. That is good. But for the Convention of Montreux, NATO cannot be present every day in the Black Sea region, as we know. So may European Union think about on a uh, let me say uh, uh, a project of uh, small of small navies, yes, small navi uh, European navies on rotation basis, who would uh, uh, be present in the Black Sea regions in order to save uh, um, navigation, free navigation, and international law, and maybe that would be even better than NATO, because it would be less provocative. Uh, for Russia, and uh, I only can here pay attention to British proposals, which are very in develop. What I want to say is with that, if you take that proposal or the other, European Union must 
in develop a strategy for that region. It, ha it, ha it has no strategy. And what me really concerns is that even in the new Eastern Partnership communications, also five countries of that Eastern Partnership are in fact part of that region. There is no own chapter, strategic chapter on the challenges of security in the Black Sea region. Maybe I stop here. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Wilfred. You have presented really a bunch of issues and really widened our discussion because we were, you know, discussing probably some 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 issues were not very much pertaining to a wider region. But you have basically, as our uh, as our as our speaker today has presented us a wider concept of that and also gave a piece of advice for the common European approach uh, during this session. I think have enriched uh, our discussion a lot. I, I'm getting some questions in the chat, so I would welcome our participants who are willing to write down the questions in the chat. If uh, if your comment probably would be too, too, too long, maybe you could also raise your hand and depending on the availability of time, we would give the floor to you, so as you could also express your opinion live. Um, there is a, a comment, or a comment or question uh, to all of you. Russia is waging aggression against the entire maritime coast. Now it is about raising threat for Smyini Island as its capture would decrease to limit free movement of ships in both seas for Ukraine. That's a question from Andri Chubik. Uh, maybe somebody would like to comment on the issue of Smyini Island. Uh, some, 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 some of you, I don't know, maybe Ms. Oterova or Hanna, you have unmuted yourself and Victor, you are also ready. Uh, well, Hannah, you start. Uh, thank you, Maria. Very briefly, um, definitely Ukraine need to follow uh, the security situation about me. Eh? However, there are two important uh, points not to exaggerate situation, uh, particularly with this island. Uh, several years ago, we already had this when the security threats to Odessa region was very high and several um, international institutions published the, the big report saying that Izmini can become the next basis for the Russian aggression or from Izmini uh, further to the south of Odessa region. However, uh, not to speculate on this issue, we need uh, perfectly to understand what is means Izmini Island. Uh, it is not sustainable island, so you definitely can create, uh, currently we have the uh, uh, border uh, control or border base there. However, um, you need to supply, first of all, everything over there. So you need not only to occupy Zmini Island, but also to organize the whole logistics over there, the whole supply chain there. The second is that uh, you can't uh, land on this island uh, 365 days per year. The weather conditions are extremely important element. So uh, ships cannot uh, uh, come there daily. And with the helicopters as well, it is always an issue. So uh, I mean that the Russian Federation also calculating the risks about keeping this island, uh, not only uh, about occupying uh, them, the costs and risk of this action. However, we definitely see the widening of the Russian actions um, in the uh, uh, area from Crimea to Zmini. But they're doing it mostly with the semi-legal actions as uh, uh, blocking or closing certain maritime areas as for the military accident. The second factor that we need to take into account is the closeness to Romania. And uh, we remember that due to the ICG decision, the territorial waters were divided in the quite a specific way. So from Zmini, two territorial waters of uh, Romania is extremely uh, close. And uh, we understand that Romania uh, will accept it as the very serious threat to their national security. And here we can have the involvement not only of the Romanian forces, but definitely of the NATO and the U.S. forces that are currently stationed um, at the territory of Romania. Thank you very much, Hannah, for your comprehensive answer and providing us with a wider picture of this. Wilfred, you would like also to comment on that, right? Supporting, uh, supporting Hannah, but I want to say the risk remains because the corridor for ships on that place is reduced to 25 kilometers. And 
it is enough not to occupy, not to kidnap, but to block something. That is already, I mean, that is um, what we see, what, what, what Hannah said, what they do is not to, to create big events, but uh, with the help of non-attention of international community to go a little bit further, maybe one day we block, one day not. And, and, uh, and that way, uh, Russia tries to further its, uh, to, to, uh, to expand its control. It's a very tricky um, hybrid method, and that should be taken into account when it comes to that detailed question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alvidas, uh, you wrote me that you would uh, like also to comment, right? Uh, yes, uh, certainly. Uh, so I think what uh, Wilfred uh, was saying is uh, really a very serious problem. And uh, this threat is, uh, I would say, the, the possible hybrid warfare is quite serious. But at the same time, uh, I see that there is uh, one big difference between the situation in the Black Sea and Azov Sea. Because in the Black Sea, uh, uh, all countries uh, have the the let's say sea border uh the delimitation of the sea borders and more or less the territory where we know if the russian ship is crossing this uh, uh this distance then it's really already some kind of aggressive action uh so therefore i have a question uh which really olena snigir uh, raised it's about azov sea which have uh, some specific uh, situation as again looking to the international law situation so Lena Snigir is asking about what are those uh, users, as she called, negotiations, long and useless negotiating process uh, with Russia about the maritime border in Azov Sea. And uh, it would be very good that some of our uh, speakers would comment this, but I would like to add one more additional question. And that it, is it really some kind of the distance, safe distance for the Ukrainian ships uh, to be in the territory uh, of uh, close to Ukrainian shore where Russian ships cannot enter. And if they enter this territory, this also is regarded as some kind of aggressive action, especially if it will be done by the military ships or the, fish, uh, or the ships uh, which would be uh, thinking that they have a responsibility to control what is going in Azov Sea. So wherefore, is it a safe distance uh, from the seashore of Ukraine uh, for Ukrainian ships at the moment? Okay, we are... Maybe okay. Hannah? I think Oksana Zolterova would be waiting to... to yeah, Oksana Zolterova, yes, sure. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, thank you. So starting from uh, the point uh, on uh, uh, putting boundaries within the Sea of Azov and in the Kerch Strait. Uh, Ukraine uh, engaged in dialogue with the Russian Federation since 1996 and uh, for all uh, about the status of the Sea of Azov and uh, the uh, demarcation there. Uh, all in all, we held 32 rounds of negotiations uh, the last one was in the end of 2013, but we never managed to reach an agreement. It is connected to various factors. Russia considers the Sea of Azov as internal waters. Ukraine considers the Sea of Azov as international waters. But as of now, and you might and must understand that now we cannot engage in the discussions with the Russian Federation on, uh, on these issues because we have really different positions. We consider Crimea to be Ukrainian territory, Russia considers uh, it to be Russian territory. Um, <clears throat> so that's why we are again in the uh, uh, International Tribunal. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the question that we are also raising before the uh, arbitrators. And then they will take their decision within the next couple or three or four years. Uh, concerning the area that is um, safe for navigation or where we could use some kind of restrictions, uh, Ukraine feels itself to be bounded by the international law and by the law of the Sea Convention. And we stand for the freedom of navigation. And that's why uh, blocking some areas for navigation uh, would be, could be um, 
against uh, this, the norms and principles of international law. Moreover, uh, uh, you might know, know that there is also another case uh, that is driven by Ukraine against the Russian Federation, and it considers uh, the immunity of uh, Ukrainian warships. Uh, these three warships that were detained by Russian Federation in the end of uh, November 2018. And there we also state that Russia Federation violated the law of the Sea Convention by detaining uh, uh, Ukrainian ships that have, uh, first, the freedom of navigation, and second, uh, that they uh, have the immunity of being detained. So this means that if we detain a uh, Russian or, or whatever country uh, military ship, uh, we will be in the same violation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Otterova. Um, I'm now looking at the questions here and trying to, you know, to structure them somehow. There was a question, what is the modern role and will be the future of the treaty between the Russian Federation and Ukraine and cooperation in the use of the Sea of Azov and the Kerch Strait? I think, Ms. Otterova, you have uh, partially started answering uh, the question. If you would like to add something more precisely with regard to the treaty, Yes, please. And uh, I've, I have seen also the hand raised by Wilfred. I think you would also like to comment with regard to the border, right? Uh, so, please, yeah. Oksana first, and then yeah. we'll, we'll Thank you. Uh, thank you. So, uh, if you look uh, uh, at this treaty, it has only one uh, operational article. This is Article 2 and or 3, I don't remember, I remember sorry. Uh, but it says uh, only about that the uh, parties of this agreement are uh, to cooperate in the spheres of ensuring the freedom of navigation, ensuring uh, uh, fisheries and uh, stuff like this. So it has no, uh, no binding uh, provisions within itself. But at the same time, we consider that the Sea of Azov is, uh, the, uh, uh, is the international sea uh, and it is not internal waters. So we consider that the uh, th agreement of 2003 is a complementary to uh, the constitution of the sea, uh, the UNCLOS Convention. Uh, that is from the legal perspective. And we don't see that uh, it contradicts something or um, not. Uh, from if you if you go back from uh, legal to political and to practical perspective, uh, the discussions about the necessity of denouncing this treaty um, are uh, now held for almost six years, uh, just after the annexation. Um, what will be the practical impact for Ukraine for denouncing this treaty? If we consider the Kerch Strait to be international strait and uh, we don't consider the Sea of Azov to be uh, uh, internal waters. So for Ukrainian legal order, there will be uh, practically uh, no changes, but uh, what will Russia uh, then do? Uh, to my mind, uh, it, will open, it will open them a good pros perspective to pronouncing the Sea of Azov as uh, the Russian lake. Because they will be no, no bonded by, as they consider this uh, boundary uh, agreement, they will be no uh, longer bonded by this. And to be very boring and to speak from legal perspective, uh, this agreement, it um, has no provision within it is on the denunciation or, uh, or the, its termination. Uh, so to denounce or terminate, we should use the Vienna Convention. The Vienna Convention says uh, that you can terminate an agreement if you have a substantive uh, change of situation. Uh, from easy point of view, you could say, yes, there is a, a substantive change of situation. Uh, but uh, if you think a bit thoroughly, uh, Ukraine does not consider uh, Crimea uh, to be lawfully occupied by the Russian Federation. And we uh, consider no changes of the status, no alteration of it. So basically, we don't have even a legal ground to denounce it. Thank you. Thank you, Oksana, for presenting us uh, the legal situation on the ground and your opinion on that. I promise to give the floor to Wilfred, and I can see also Konstantin Demyanenko willing to comment. So please, uh, Wilfred, and then 
simply a short comment. Uh, I mean, I'm in principle uh, concerning the political aims. I'm very agree with uh, uh, Solo, Mrs. Solotarovia, but I think it is a little bit more complicated. I mean, uh, Ukraine signed uh, signed an agreement in 2003. By the way, Western partners of uh, that uh, of that time warned Mr. Kuchma to sign that agreement, actually because it will stop international law in the Sea of Azov. What we have now, we have uh, the proceeding at the International Tribunal uh, in Den Haag, and uh, here the tribunal has decided to, to um, look in the main part of the process if, uh, if um, uh, Azov Sea is an international internal water. If it is an internal water, uh, they denied to have a jurisdiction uh, in that case. So that means uh, the problem is internal water uh, is in international common law a condominium where you have no lines you have no economic zones you have no limitations of any borders you have not that and um, so if they declare it's an historical internal water ukraine will even lose what they have now that the russia that russia is still committed to that agreement and uh, contradicts its its own commitment because even if we lay the ground uh, for the conflict with that agreement, the catch street occupation is also illegal. It is illegal for enclose and it is illegal uh, 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 when, when you argue with that agreement. But there is a big risk because what will happen if the tribunal will open Azov Sea for international law? It will nothing happen. The Russians will say that they can take uh, uh, the law of their constitution above the international law. And actually, that would be a nice case when you have even an agreement with Ukraine that Russia can make use of these new amendments in their own constitution at first. Secondly, uh, given the very uh, difficult situation as of sea, I think NATO, nevertheless, even if international law will be uh, effective here, uh, nevertheless, will visit on a large scale the ports of Ukraine in that sea. I think you should not expect that. So, what I only want to see, I will a little bit put water in the, into the wine, yes, because it is a very controversial, uh, uh, controversial question. Uh, if uh, you can simply say no international in, internal water is not to be applied here, it is very difficult, and that was and that was is very important. What we should see here. Why did the Russian uh, propose Kuchma in internal water? Because actually what they also do now in the Caspian region, they call the Caspian Sea a sea. So there, is, there isn't any category of international law in order to keep international extract powers outside the sea. And, and that, is, that, that was already a mistake in 2003. But I hope, of course, that the, uh, that the tribunal will have findings when they say they negotiated about the boundary, so maybe the tribunal will say Russia did not treat the internal water as an internal water. That is a big risk also. So what I only want to tell you, the things, the things can go that way and the things can go that way. Thank you. Thank you, Victor, very much for your thorough analysis of the situation. Constantine, I think uh, you raised your hand and wanted to add something to, to, to the discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for Oksana, to Oksana and Wilfried for so comprehensive uh, description of the situation in uh, relation to international legislation. Uh, I would like to speak uh, about technical aspect of uh, fisheries in the Sea of Azov. Uh, till uh, current year, uh, fishery in the Sea of Azov are regulated. Uh, this uh, Ukraine-Russian Commission on Fisheries in the Sea of Azov, uh, which uh, was uh, founded in uh, 1992 uh, 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 with uh, relevant Ukraine-Russian uh, agreement on fisheries. And this commission uh, is acting uh, till now. So about my technical aspect of uh, this commission. Firstly, 
Uh, Ukraine and the Russian Federation are only two countries exploiting shared stocks of uh, marine living resources in the Sea of Azov. Thus, a responsibility of con on conservation and rational use of these living resources is actual for both these countries. Since uh, 1992, the Commission provides recommendations on catch limit for each of mild exploited fish species, including the national quota values, which is a tool to keep exploitation of marine living resources under the scientifically based allowable catch. Implementation of the Commission's decision on catch limits and quotas and conservation measures was done by each country for the all years since the first year, year of the Commission's work. It is possible to state that the all sea of other area is still available for Ukrainian fishermen, according to agreed by the Commission conservation measures. Secondly, it is needed to mention that fisheries control bodies of both states, Ukraine and Russian Federation, are acting under the require, requirement by a relevant commission's decision also. And the Ukrainian fishermen are protected much better with it in the open marine area. As a result, Ukraine achieves with the commission better conservation of marine living resources as well as better safety for Ukrainian fishermen in the Sea of Azov. Thus, in our view, the Commission still plays important technical role on marine living resources protection and fish regulation for the basin of the Sea of Azov, not touching crime issues. And it would be a great challenge to solve a problem to replace this Commission by something other and to identify the real way how it could be realized in actual political circumstances. It is absolutely so that the situation is the Black Sea, where Russia is keeping its military control and use of marine living resources over large part of the Ukrainian marine economical zone. It is very different comparing to the situation on the Sea of Azov. And of course, it seems impossible to speak about any kinds of fisheries coordination between Ukraine and Russian Federation in the Black Sea. So we should conclude that, unfortunately, uh, current times are really crazy times for international relations on fisheries and marine ecology. It is sure not Ukraine's responsibility, but we all have to live and act in these circumstances. Thank you very much for your attention. Agnes, would you continue? We have a bunch of questions with regard to economy and energy yes, and so gas fields. That's right, that's right, that's right. So, yes, so my also questions regarding economy to uh, David Saha, uh, is that he would uh, answer uh, those uh, those questions. Well, the, so part of them on the Black Sea, but I also have a question regarding the uh, Azov Sea, because now there are a lot of uh, discussions going on about so-called uh, rebuilding of uh, Donbass, of developing economically and socially Donbass. Of course, certainly at the beginning of this territory, which is uh, controlled by Ukraine, because it cannot be developed, the territory's uh, control of Russia. So did you look in your study also the, uh, this uh, situation and this problem, how those two ports, but particularly port of Mariupol, is important for the economical development of Donbass, not only in the field of the uh, steel production, but in all other possible fields. We have now discussed about the possible uh, economical agenda of uh, possible uh, development of uh, Donbass. Oh, yes, uh, thank you. We we didn't really look at the question of uh, developing Donbass after a potential resolution of the crisis. Uh, what I can say is, um, regarding the role of the port of Mariupol, it always used to be a port mainly for the steel industry, right? And of course, our major steel mills that are now uh, uh, not under Ukrainian control in the non-controlled territories that were also seized from their owners. I mean, previously, when 
the conflict was already ongoing. They, some of those companies were still producing, were still uh, under the control of the owners, so they could still legitimately export Ukrainian steel through uh, the port. Um, and that, of course, was a relatively vital outlet to those uh, to those industries. And I think it's really mainly about the steel industry because that is probably the heaviest export on uh, the steel and coal, really, what they would produce in, in the non-controlled parts of the Donbass. Um, of course, for the connection of that area to the world economy, this is the major port, right? This is the closest port. And it, it would play a large role. I mean, right now, of course, uh, we don't really know to what extent those uh, plants are operating. I think many of them are not, uh, not or at least uh, only operating at very small capacity because, of course, right now, um, nobody can, can buy these uh, goods because they are uh, not recognized uh, by any other countries. They're, they're not Ukrainian goods anymore because the company, uh, companies, the assets have been seized. Uh, they cannot just be sold as Russian goods, of course, because they're produced in the territory of Ukraine. They can possibly sort of, you can try to smuggle them under and give it a Russian sticker and so on. But I think even in Russia, there would be little interest because uh, they have their own steel industry and there's not exactly a shortage of capacity on the steel market. So at the moment, there's relatively little interest for that. In case of a resolution, yes, it would still be the main court. Uh, it would play a role. Um, but uh, I mean, if you, I'm not sure whether the question also uh, referred to reconstructing and redeveloping the Donbas entirely. I think that's a challenge of its own, and that would really require much wider analysis and study what should be done there, because uh, it's not only that it's sort of rebuilding uh, an economy after a conflict and just getting back to where it was, but also the world is moving on, especially sort of this heavy industry uh, stuff. Uh, that's a difficult world market situation, and it's basically that you're not you're facing structural change at the same time. And it would actually be a question of whether there would be much use of going back to uh, where you were before. Uh, but you know that's that's another matter. We don't exactly know the extent of destruction as well due to the conflict, um, and that uh, it would be a very difficult task. That's for sure. It's not not going to be easy. Well, thank you very much, uh, David. And of course, uh, somebody could wonder what would happen if, let's say, the Chinese really will go with the investments in the Mariupol seaport. Uh, would it be helpful for the passage of the ships uh, to, the, uh, to the Mariupol seaport when uh, looking into the China-Russian uh, relations? But of course, there is another also question by that uh, Tony Winterthur from the Kligenthal Institute about this exploration and also what Wilfred uh, raised this point about exploration of the uh, energy resources and and uh, black sea so who would like to who would like to respond to that maybe including those people who asked the question <laughs> so <laughs> it would be very important to get the answer well but basically the question is also about the expectation uh, of the ukrainian side uh, with regard to the eu reaction to this so maybe Ms. Otero would be willing also uh, to comment on that but I'm seeing also in the meantime, Wilfred is ready to tell us his opinion. So please, you will start. Yes, because um, I, I mentioned that problem. So I allow to say something about that. I mean, uh, I mean, of course, Russia does not recognize many parts now of international sea law, or let me say, it is not affirmatively working with it. So um, of course, appeals do not matter. Yes, but on the other side, uh, I would like to remind you, uh, when in 2018 we had that incident uh, in Azov Sea and we had the resolution of the European Parliament maybe for implementing new sanctions, when we had all these discussions about monitoring on the catch street, uh, the blockade times in the catch street uh, also uh, went down. So please be aware. At first, the situation in Russia at the, at, at the time now is very difficult, very, very difficult. So I also do not see a wider escalation now, yes, because Russia is a petro autocracy and only if oil prices are high, to be to roughly speaking, uh, they, they, they did, did anything in the past. But on the other side, uh, European Union in order, when, when it monitors the situations and bring every time these things on the table, 
that does matter a little bit. The Russian, uh, the Russian side doesn't want to be observed in their, let me say, hybrid actions. And that is what I criticize. European Union is not coherent. European Union is a sea power, a trade power, and it has a, 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 a big interest in saving these rules. And so it at least should happen to monitor and also maybe when it comes to, to the gas platforms, which is really a crucial thing because it has uh, an economic dimension, which is very bad for Ukraine, and a military dimension. And uh, if you take that uh, for a basis, uh, let me say, only to prepare new sanctions, you can be, uh, you can be uh, uh, confirmed that uh, that will matter. It mattered already, but Euro European, uh, European Union could already do something, but they are not coherent. They do not continue. And that, that is a big problem. So uh, to have the first steps would be already positive. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Oksana, uh, would you be willing uh, to answer to also to the question of expectations? Um, uh, of course, it's very easy to say that Russian Federation uh, does not respect international law and we can do nothing with the Russian Federation in this uh, sphere. But actually, uh, the practice shows uh, that Russia pretends not to respect international law. Of course, being uh, such a specific state, it will never admit that we do care about the international law. But if you look back uh, on uh, the situation of Russia implementing the decisions of international courts and tribunals, uh, there was a very uh, famous case, Arctic Sunrise, when R Russia detained uh, fisheries Greenpeace uh, vessel uh, by the da of the Dutch. And the Netherlands then filed its case um, in the arbitral tribunal, uh, they won both jurisdic jurisdiction and the merits phase. Russia always pretended that it will never implement it. But nevertheless, Russia impl implemented it. Uh, it re uh, Russia released the vessel and uh, the, the crew right after its decision on, uh, on provisional measures. And uh, uh, after that, Russia uh, concluded an agreement with the Netherlands and paid them the money they agreed on. The same situation is with Ukrainian uh, uh, military vessels that were detained. Russia denied jurisdiction uh, of the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea. Russia didn't appear there. Uh, then after Ukraine won the jurisdiction, Russia, what Russia did, uh, it even though it denied uh, the, the decision, but it's uh, it still uh, released the vessels and uh, the crew. Of course, uh, a, a lot has to be done uh, for to make Russia implement the decisions of international laws and tribunals and uh, to comply with the regulations of the civilized world. Ukraine cannot uh, stand alone in this issue. And we always call upon uh, all our partners to press on the Russian Federation in this regard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oksana, for your position. Uh, now we know that both our European think tankers, European partners, and of course, Ukrainian authorities are willing to do everything possible in order to defend our interests. And it's like pleasant to hear the support from both the Ukrainian, of course, it's self-understanding and the European side. There is one very uh, specific question with regard uh, to the percentage of the ships traveling under the flag of the EU member states using the Ukrainian Azov Sea port. Probably some of our participants, I don't know, maybe you, David, do you know this data? That's a question from Susan Stewart. She would be particularly interested because it would be important for the assessing the economic interest of the EU in the area. And you have mentioned this in your speech. Maybe you know this with the numbers. I don't know the exact numbers. Um, I mean, there is data. Uh, I think Black, the Black News, uh, Black Sea News uh, portal, uh, because they collect the stuff quite exactly, and they basically have every ship passing, and its delay. So, if someone uh, were to be really interested in that, I think that can be looked uh, looked into. Of course, you know, many of the uh, ships will actually be sort of EU. Um, uh, shipping companies, but with uh, potentially also the flags of Liberia and so on, which is, I mean, that, that's just how, how it's being done in shipping. But 
uh, I think, if I remember correctly, taking a look at the data last year, there were quite a few uh, ships home ported in EU countries. So, uh, but I don't have any shared in it. Uh, Okay, thank you very much. So uh, you uh, referred to many times to the Black Sea News. This will be a valuable source of information for everyone who's taking part uh, in this discussion, if one wants to get uh, more data. Uh, basically, if I'm looking at the time, we have exhausted the time that we have spent for uh, this discussion. But I would like to give the floor to any of our speakers. Maybe somebody would like to have a wrap-up comment, like a final remark after all this has been said. Please, if somebody is willing to say anything in the very end, uh, uh, yeah, you could raise your hand or uh, or unmute yourself or signal to us to what you would like to say. Wilfried, I see you. Yes, please. Yes, I, I only want to thank you very much for that. I think it's very important to, to raise the attention to that problem because uh, when we see that the Baltic Sea now gets more attention by NATO and European Union, that is not proportionally the same case uh, in the Black Sea. And even if NATO and EU would do what they can and what they can do in the Baltic region, I think that very matters for Russia. I also, also underline what Oksana said. It is absolutely right. Russia is interested about his reputation when it comes to international law because Putin tries to find for every action and legitimation. Therefore, I spoke about gray zones. And the gray zones are already possible or only possible if violations or uh, the not strict following of procedures is not criticized by the international community. We know, for example, that also discussions on, on SNAP uh, uh, exercises, when it comes to discussions on the basis of the International Sea Organization, that maritime organization, IMO, that all matters. I mean, that all matters in a, in a compact uh, strategy. And, and what I want also to underline is uh, uh, economic interest. I mean, it's clear the interest. Black Sea and also Azov Sea is a connection between Asia and Europe. And that is one of the biggest uh, challenges defined by European Commission. So what we need here is a comprehensive program for reforming the infrastructure of ports of Ukraine, Georgia, and other states which are associated uh, to the European Union, because you can all only make safe these routes by more connectivity, structural reforms, better governance, which makes these states less re more resilient to these hybrid interventions from the from the side uh, of, of Russia. And I think uh, it is the own interest because uh, these trade routes become will become so important for energy, for, for trade, for services, uh, uh, that uh, European Union uh, should understand that that is a common task. It is not something you suggest to these states. It's a common task to make these neighborhoods safer. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much, Wilfred, for 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 your for your thoughts and for your comments. And I think the reason why we organized uh, this online discussion uh, with the foundation together with the Angel of Don Moscow is first of all to attract attention. Uh, even though we are now attracting attention at the at the, at the OEC forum, it's one of the sessions that used to be taking place there. Uh, it was devoted exclusively to the CEO and also basically we are politically highly on time having our public discussion. So we are having here with us today international experts, Ukrainian experts who are professionals dealing with the issue. And that is why I think we have uh, we have done what 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 basically we have gathered for the, the, this discussion. So if no one else is uh, willing to add anything at this uh, point, I would like to cordially thank you all of you for all your time taken, for your knowledge and for your efforts uh, invested to, to our discussion. Thank you very much for all your thoughts. It was very enlightening to us and to all, all, all of all of all of our participants. I would like what can I wish you now, first of all, to stay healthy, to stay safe. And of course, as we are having uh, summer now, to enjoy summer and have the uh, opportunity uh, to take rest a bit before autumn, which again, the background of the COVID crisis would be uh, pretty uh, work intensive for all of us, I believe. So once again, thank you very much for being with us and uh, let's stay tuned. Uh, we will, of course, if we organize further discussion on any security related issues, 
together with the Donbass Gate NGO, we will also inform you and send you uh, the email invitation. Please, uh, if you have interested, join us. And we will be very much looking forward to further opportunity to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.